This is Meet the Candidates on Brattleboro Community Television. I'm Chris Lenoir, your host, and today I'm speaking with Emily Kornheiser. She's running for state representative in Brattleboro's first district. Welcome, Emily. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate you being here. And uh, like uh, somebody else I interviewed recently, Cindy Jerome, you're a recent graduate of the Emerge program here in Vermont, prepares women to run as candidates for the Democrat Party. But as I was reading your website, I kind of got the sense that this is something that's been brewing for you for a little bit longer than that. Uh, you, it, would that be accurate? Absolutely, absolutely. I have actually always loved government, which I think is a slightly strange thing to say in this climate, even <laughs> across the political spectrum. But I thought for many years that I wanted to work in government. Um, in Washington for accountability groups, maybe for the census, and then have really enjoyed working in state government, doing accountability work. But the more I really focused my attentions on Brattleboro and on our own community, the more I felt like the most effective place for me to make change and to advocate would be in the legislature. Yeah. So I attended the Vermont Leadership Institute, which is a project of the Snelling Center, which really helps people understand how government in Vermont works, how the pieces fit together, and how to bring our best selves to that. And then in the next year, I attended a march to really understand the intricacies of running for office. Yeah. And I mean, I think if people read the bio on your website, they'll see you're no stranger to being involved in local organizations and involved in some levels on town government here mm -hmm. as well. With regards to Emerge, what do you think that's added to your toolkit? One thing that was incredible is to be part of this wave of new women entering politics. Um, some people call it the blue wave, some people call it the female wave, whatever we want to call it. But to be part of the largest cohort that Emerge has ever had in Vermont, some women who had really just woken up to politics um, with the now sort of recent election, but with the election, and to be feel like we're really part of a larger part of change was really compelling. And to know women from all different parts of the state, to see how politics can play differently in different parts of the state. And then part of it was just really learning the mechanics. Yeah, I think, you know, I think the, the Emerge certainly is is a program geared towards the Democratic Party, but mm -hmm. when I look at some of the national trends, I think you know this this wave is more around women getting involved in elected office. I think we could probably look at a lot of other parts of the country where they are looking at re more Republican candidates who are who are female, and I, I just wonder in a state like Vermont where we already have great representation up in Montpelier, especially here in Wyndham County, uh, one of them that you're running against in this mm -hmm. primary, Valerie Stewart, mm -hmm. what you're telling candidates in District 1 about your candidacy versus Valerie's? A few things. One, I think that um, in terms of what it means for me to be a woman running for office, I think being a feminist means thinking about the needs and issues of all women. Um, and particularly women who are most marginalized in our community. So I really try to bring attention to that in everything I do. I'm always asking the question, and I will be always asking the question when I'm in committee in the legislature, who is most affected by the work we're doing? What are the unintended consequences of that? Who gains and who loses? And often the answers to that lies in the mouths of women who are marginalized in our communities. So that's a particular perspective that I think I bring to this. It's more of a solidarity perspective. Yeah. Is there something in particular with Valerie's representation, since she's been uh, elected to several terms here for, for District 1, mm -hmm. uh, that you think you're, you're bringing to the table or that she wasn't bringing to the table? I think a lot of what I bring to the table is a real ability to think across issues. There's sort of a progressive checklist of issues so that people know how to vote on certain issues and know sort of where justice lies. But I think the real value if we want Vermont to thrive is to be able to think how those issues intersect with each other, how to ask questions of our community about how people are affected by those policies, and to move things together in conjunction. So I have really pretty incredible facilitation skills that I would bring to my committee work as well as to working with the body as a whole. And I'm able to see what the leverage points are to move larger issues forward. So we can take a very small example, such as the car emissions. Um, so we have new regulations now in Vermont about cars and how cars are inspected. And that's wonderful, because it means that we're fighting you know, an important progressive cause, climate change. Right. But I want to make sure that when we're passing laws like that, we're taking into effect and the impact of folks who can't afford to deal with the check engine light. You know, I have a check engine light on right now. My car's due for inspection next month. And I have no idea how much that's going to cost me, even though my car seems to be running the same. So really, 
thinking about those right. kinds of things, thinking about what is the financial impact on people who are least able to afford it, many of our issues, and how are we benefiting people who are most able to afford it. Yeah. Well, I mean, something that I, I marked on the website as I was preparing for this interview that I really liked what you said um, was, for democracy to work, we need to close the gap between government and community. Mm -hmm. And I think that really is a, a powerful statement to make. Somewhat surprising in a state like Vermont, where we have probably more proximity to our elected officials mm -hmm. than other states. So, I mean, how, how did you mean that? Well, I think many of us um, feel that we have a right to the voice of our elected officials. We feel comfortable interrupting our elected official in the grocery store. I don't know if it's really an interruption, but you know, getting through the grocery store is hard enough now. I can't imagine what it's going to be like when I'm elected. Um, and so a lot of us feel like we have that right. We have the right to call. We have the right to write. And many of us have time or um, freedom to go testify if we're invited. But being able to navigate those systems is very different from for some people of one class versus people who are living in a more scarcity environment. For people who are living under scarcity, their experience of government is as a gatekeeper to benefits. And because our government is so underfunded right now in Vermont, that has really been tightened and tightened and tightened. So that gatekeeping becomes even more an issue. Mm -hmm. And if that's people's first experience of government and their regular experience of government, then they don't realize that there's a second path of the elected official that is accessible. Unless their elected official is really out in the community and where people are and meeting people where they are. So as I've been knocking on doors all over, I think I've gotten to more than 2,000 people now, it's been incredible when I show up on some people's doors, they're just shocked and excited and can't believe that I'm there to just sit on their stoop and hear what's going on for them. And that I'm able to connect each of those issues to a policy issue, something that we might be able to look at or change. Right. Now, the Democratic primary is in August. Mm -hmm. uh, so far, no Republicans have thrown their hats in the ring. And very likely in Wyndham County, uh, the August primary is the election mm -hmm. uh, here for Wyndham County for your seat. And that brings me to something that you talk about when you're talking about building coalitions. And you're going to go to Montpelier. And even though we are a largely blue state in that mm -hmm. regard, uh, we do have our pockets of conservative thinkers out there. Uh, how do you bring them into that fold, especially when there is sort of when you're the, the minority party or the, in some cases, super minority party, you're automatically coming from this position of, I've got to fight for every inch you know, that I want to get. Mm -hmm. One of the things that's been interesting to me about the idea that we have a citizen's legislature is that many, of, uh, many folks go up to the legislature coming from their particular life perspective, whether that's, um, you know, doing design or um, as an attorney or whatever it is. And that I would be coming to the legislature as someone who's been working across lines in government for most of my career. So when I was brokering public-private partnerships overseas, it wasn't about what is the morally right decision here, which is a fine way to have conversations with your friends. It's a fine way to get in an argument on Facebook. But if we're really trying to come to decisions about what makes a thriving Vermont, I think we have to move outside of our righteousness and move into conversations about what is the outcome that we're seeking. We want a vibrant economy. That's something that we want. And some people might want a vibrant economy because they want everyone to make a living wage. And some people might want a vibrant economy because they want to strengthen their own pocketbooks. Um, and some people might want a vibrant economy because they know it's going to best protect the environment. But we need to make sure that we're really focusing on those ends and not getting lost in righteousness around the means. And I think that's a really possible and straightforward way to work across difference. Yeah. I like also that you put a couple of phrases together when you talked about your expertise and, and building coalitions that we just talked about. You paired that with navigating bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. And certainly, I, I think, you know, some of those, those hoops that people have to jump through for social support services and things like that mm -hmm. are, are things that you're referring to there. When I think, though, about some of the other things that you talk about with regards to regulatory framework, mm -hmm. and you actually list that as a strength mm -hmm. of Vermont's industry and economy. Mm -hmm. uh, you even talk for more oversight into areas like healthcare and mm -hmm. telecom. And then I think of stories that I've heard about Vermont Health Connect and mm. people navigating that mm -hmm. website. Not necessarily the care, but mm -hmm. just trying to get the care, getting their insurance policies and everything. Think about votes related to local control of mm -hmm. renewable energy siting or school districts. Does Vermont have an appetite for navigating bureaucracy? I mean, oh, when I you're, love when you're that talking question. about that, 
Mm -hmm. I don't, and you know, and, and I think a lot of people, again, you talk about your, your politics and, and people being democratic, but there's also sort of when you're talking about navigating bureaucracy, you're kind of swimming against the tide there. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have bureaucracy whether we want bureaucracy or not. We have bureaucracy in small organizations, we have bureaucracy in large organizations. What we want is bureaucracy that is transparent so that we know how to navigate it. And some people are particularly skilled at seeing a bureaucracy and navigating it. And that's some, just a natural strength that I bring, starting from studying sociology in undergrad and onwards through that. But when we make bureaucracies transparent, whether that's the regulatory framework for building codes, or whether that's a regulatory framework for schools and school financing, then people have enough knowledge to make decisions with it. And they can make participatory decisions, whether that's in town meeting, or whether that's trying to site a building. And so I don't know if the answer is more bureaucracy or less bureaucracy. I think what I'm seeking is transparent bureaucracy. And, and one really key way to make tra bureaucracy transparent is to take it out of the private sector and put it in the public sector. Right now, most of our health care needs are met by the private sector. Vermont Health Connect is delivered by the private sector. It's just the bureaucracy is sitting in the public sector. But if we can bring those two things together, and this is getting a little too wonky, I think. Um, <laughs> Not for me, but <laughs> I was the one who asked the question. Yes. But yeah. I think when we um, stop thinking about issues that are common goods, whether that's health insurance or our ability to communicate with each other via telecom, when we think of them as public goods and both make them transparent enough that people can participate in decision making, and set regulations so that we have a bar, whether that's a bar of equity or a bar of accessibility, then people know what they need to transparently discuss, participate in, and meet. So yeah. to make an example, to take this out of the wonk and into the real world, um, we know that communities want to meet a certain level of green energy by 2050, 2020, whatever benchmarks we want to set. And we leave it up to the communities to figure out how to do that. But we set certain parameters that they have to meet. We've done that already to some extent. But what we've left out is people helping communities to do that. So we're all just you know, mucking around trying to figure it out when there are people who work for state government who could really help us figure out how to do that best. Yeah. Given some of your positions and some of your strengths, have you thought about committee assignments you would like to have if you were elected to go up to Montpelier? Um, everyone asks me that, and I have to come up for a tidier question, because the <laughs> truth is, they all sound really wonderful right. to me. I'm, and then as a first year, you're going to get what you're given. And I'm going to get what I'm given. <laughs> it's the same way people say, what is your one cause? And I say, it doesn't matter what my one cause is, because mm -hmm. no one will pay any attention to it when I get to the legislature anyway. Right, right. And I wouldn't vote for someone who has a single cause, because I know they're not going to be effective with their single cause. Um, I don't have a committee that I'm very excited about, or that a single committee that I'm very excited about. They all sound really fun. Um, I'm very interested in our taxation structure. I would like to be part of the process to look that over and to fix it, because it desperately needs fixing. Um, I think a lot of our pro challenges lies in um, how we think about revenue in Vermont. I. Housing and general affairs would be fun. Economic development is fun. I, the one committee that I would prefer not to be on is health and human services mm. because I've spent so much of my recent career working with those commissioners. I work for youth services now, small nonprofit that gets funding from health and human services. So I think there would be a few too many conflicts of interest for me to be comfortably available and able to sit in and make decisions on every single yeah. topic that comes up. Yeah. So I would probably recuse myself from that, but any of the others would be most fun. Right. Well, I say, you know, you talk about taxation and, you know, some people treat the word tax like it's a four-letter word rather than a three-letter word. And certainly, mm -hmm. uh, no matter what you're talking about, it's through the lens of affordability mm -hmm. here in the state of Vermont. And you talk a little bit about, in the issues section of your website, uh, how you envision Vermont families supported by progressive taxation. Mm -hmm. uh, what is a progressive versus a regressive tax is sometimes in the eye of the beholder. I'm wondering what mm. your definition is of a progressive tax. Um, well, I'd like to step back for one second. Okay. And taxes, mm -hmm. much like civilization, we've come to as a way of organizing ourselves because we live close together. So we've developed government because we live in civilization and we need to figure out some way to all get along with each other. And there are a lot of arguments about the best way to do that, but this is the one we have right now. And taxation is similarly 
how we all get along with each other with our dollars, how we share resources, right? right. It's not it's not government against us and us, you know, us defending our goods. It's a way of making sure that our goods are used collectively because sometimes using goods collectively is more efficient than using them individually. So I think that's an important thing to understand about taxes when we talk about what a progressive taxation looks like. Um, for me, progressive taxation means people being able to pay as they're able. So it's not a particular type of tax, income tax versus progressive tax versus sales tax. It right? really That's depends. Sort of so thing. sales taxes right. tend to be regressive taxes right. because they're put on goods that people must buy, um, and they tend to impact folks who are spending more money, who are spending money regularly more than people who are saving and have the ability to save. Right. Mm -hmm. So they tax everyone equally rather than equitably. However, there are ways that income taxes can be regressive as well. Right. So I wouldn't say there's a, f and then some sales taxes, if they're at luxury goods, that can often be a progressive tax. Right. And, and one of the um, recommendations a few years ago by a commission here in Vermont that I'm sure you're aware of, uh, talking about taxation in Vermont and being more equitable with taxing would be by taxing services mm -hmm. in addition to goods or maybe in place of goods. I don't know if you have think there's any merit to an idea like that. I think there's certainly merit to an idea like that. But again, it really, so much of the value, um, the value here comes from the details, which makes interviews like this difficult, right. but makes the, um, the process in committee very interesting and compelling and is so important, such an important part of why we want to bring more, why I want to bring many more citizens into the process. Yeah. So that we're really understanding what it looks like when people are using services, who is using our services, how will that affect the people who are delivering services. Our tourism economy employs so many people in unstable jobs with unstable incomes, often seasonally, often really without worker safety. It's probably one of the places we have highest levels of sexual harassment that goes unreported. Um, a lot of, and so if we're thinking about the service sector, how can we use taxation in the service sector to really help that sector be as robust and supportive of Vermonters as we can? Yeah. So yeah. taxation is not just a tool for making money, it's also a tool for shaping policy. Yeah. Of course, the other side of that is Wages. You yes. Know, people get paid more, they can pay more into taxes. It seems yes. like a similar formula, but some people are resistant to that. You, uh, on your website, talk a little bit about living wage. You don't specify what a living wage is. I'm wondering what that is in your mind. Is it that $15 an hour number that we hear a lot of different, both national and state politicians talk about? And then also, how do you think we get there? So. The affordability paradigm, I think, is really interesting because affordability might mean that our costs are lower, but it might just mean that we have more money to afford more things. So right. it's, you know, we throw that word around, but we rarely know what we mean by it or are very, very clear about what we mean by it. I, when I think about what affordability looks like and what wages look like and what a living wage looks like, it's all of the different pieces. So when I'm knocking on someone's door and the first thing they tell me as a problem is that their property taxes are too high, I say, is it that you don't have enough money? What if your health insurance and your health care costs were free? Would you have more money? Would your property taxes feel fine to you? What if you felt like your kids were going you know, to a safe early care and education site every day and you weren't paying for that? Would your taxes still be too high? So when we think about a living wage, I think it's really hard to think about it in isolation. A living wage right now, if we didn't fix our housing crisis and we didn't fix the benefits cliff, and we didn't fix the incredibly high cost of early care and education and senior care and all kinds of things, if we just left everything else as it is, I think a living wage is probably more than $20 an hour here in Vermont. Mm -hmm. And that's a big leap. <laughs> <laughs> so, but would you say then, so where, or are you reluctant to put a number on what a living wage is based on all those factors? Well, I think given all those factors, right. what's really important is that we're moving all of those things along together. So yeah. even with the conversation about the $15 minimum wage, I said on the Vermont Commission on Women, we had a long conversation about what it looks like to endorse that. And it seems like, you know, to me at least, a foregone conclusion, a $15 minimum wage is not very much money. People still can't even actually live on $15 an hour. But we had many conversations about how there was a certain group of single mothers 
who, if the $15 minimum wage was implemented, were going to actually be worse off because their benefits were going to be cut back to a point where their bottom line was worse. And so some folks were thinking maybe we shouldn't endorse the $15 minimum wage because this population will be worse off. And what we all said was really, well, what I said was, can we ask those women about which they would rather? Or can we just fix the benefits cliff? So I think if we put in place health care, something like single payer or Medicare for all, as Bernie is now calling it, if we put in place child care that was free or low cost, you know, right. if our housing crisis was solved and housing costs could come down a little bit, then maybe a $15 minimum wage would be sufficient. Yeah. Right now it's not. Right. Well, so you, and you bring up, you know, Medicare for all and, mm -hmm. and you use the uh, adjective, not adjective, pronoun, we. Mm -hmm. uh, but that is a federal program. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of things you're talking about with benefits clift, especially in a state, and you alluded to this earlier, mm -hmm. we are a state heavily dependent on federal dollars to enact mm -hmm. any of these programs. As a state lawmaker, where do you see yourself making an impact on these issues? Part of why I decided to run was because I do think that we can make an impact on the state level. And the world, we were talking about this before we started the interview, the national news seems quite hopeless some days. And our ability to make change in that feels quite hopeless some days. And when I talk to Vermonters about voting, they see no point in voting these days because of how it all just feels like a drop in a bucket of chaos and misery. But because we know our legislators here, because you know 500 votes is enough to get elected in a primary, because in the legislature, people all get to know each other well enough that good policy can happen, because collaboration can happen, because deliberation can happen. I think Vermont has a chance of passing some really compelling laws and implementing those compelling laws, not just putting them on the books, but also funding them, so that we can be a shining star for the rest of the country, as we have been in the past. And so that other states can learn from that, and we can create some momentum. If enough states pass enough of the same law, it will become essentially federal policy. There are larger challenges about the financing, which you alluded to. Um, we already are quite flexible with our state benefits here compared to some other states. And um, whether that is how we deliver health care, um, the way we've expanded Medicaid, the way Medicaid funds can be used for prevention now, not just treatment. We've done a lot of flexible, flexible work with federal money. And we can match federal money in different ways. Because in the end, if we're investing in all of these things up front, we're actually going to be saving money in the long run. It's not just, you know, it's not just the just thing to do. It's, in fact, the economically wise thing to do is to invest in prevention, whether that's in terms of wages or housing or child care. We save money in the long run because people's health is better. We have lower incarceration rates. And our community is, as you said, spending more money. And so continuing to reinvest in itself. Yeah. Now, uh, from your perspective, uh, a lot of what you envision uh, doing in the legislature would be aided greatly by a Democratic Party governor. Mm -hmm. uh, there are four there currently are. running yes. uh, for the primary. James Ellers, Christine Hallquist, Brenda Siegel, and Ethan Sonneborn. Wondering if any of them strike you as more aligned than the other candidates for how you envision uh, the state of Vermont becoming. Is there somebody who you think is, you know, again, more suited, more of an Emily Kornheiser type Democrat? Yes. <laughs> um, as a town representative to the county committee, I don't feel like I can endorse anyone. Right. Because um, that's sort of part of our protocol is that we tend to not endorse. The committees don't endorse in primaries. I see something quite interesting in all of them. Um, I really respect Ethan is 13, for any of our listeners who don't know that. I love how he shows yeah. up. <laughs> right. He's just showing up. He's doing what he believes to do. He's living his sort of best self and his own dreams. That is so beautiful. And he has a, a very firm handshake and great eye contact. Yeah. Well, and if anyway he's worried about his age, he'll be 14, I believe, by the time the, great. the election comes great. around. So, so yeah. I think there's something. So I find a real inspiration in that piece of Ethan, right? Yeah. Um, I really appreciate how Brenda Siegel continues to speak for the lives that she's lived and the experiences she's had. That really resonates for me. I think it's really important that we have representation who have experienced some trials, been close to people who experienced some trials, who have a connection to a wide swath of our community. And I appreciate how Brenda brings lived experience to each of the really hot button issues right now in our legislature. Mm. Um, James Ellers, I respect how 
right now his policy points are just a straight solid left. I mean, he comes across on paper as this really incredible pro-union, pro-labor, pro-social justice, far left candidate. And that really resonates for me, that clarity of position, because that's, I feel a clarity of position about how we can create a vibrant Vermont. And then Christine Hallquist also really impresses me. Um, and maybe, you know, the way she has really incredible management skills, administrative skills, which is, I think, a quality we don't think of as often as we should when we think about who is in our government. I think it's important to have people who understand government, who understand how administration works, who understands how bureaucracies can be navigated, and who really exemplifies strong collaborative leadership skills. I think that's the kind of leader we want in Vermont, yeah. whether that's in the legislature or in a governor. Yeah. I also appreciate how much Christine understands cooperative economics and our infrastructure, which are two really key pieces, growth areas for Vermont, whether that's telecom in terms of our infrastructure, our green energy economy, or um, we have one of the biggest co-op movements in the country, yeah. and that's well, a really growth area. So. When people go to the polls in District 1 on mm -hmm. August 14th and ask for that Democratic ballot, they're going to have a choice uh, for one of those four candidates mm -hmm. for governor, and they're going to have a choice between you and Valerie Stewart mm -hmm. uh, for the state representative. We wanted to give you a chance as we close out here to address the voters at home as why uh, what they should be thinking about your candidacy when they go to the polls. Thank you. What my greatest hope for our district is is that people show up, that we take the time to have the conversations with our neighbors and with our coworkers and with our families about voting, about what it means to be making a choice between two candidates, about what each of our qualifications are in terms of our perspective, our frame for understanding community, our frame for understanding democracy, our frame for understanding what government can do for us and why it exists. And to vote, because it matters in this election. It might not matter in all of the elections that we enter. But part of the reason that I think this is so compelling is because when we have primaries where we can really get into the issues and understand that so much of this policy shapes our lives. And I hope and wish and ask each voter to think about how policy shapes their life and how as a legislator, I will listen to those lives in order to shape policy. So please, go vote. You can do it tomorrow. You can do it the next day. And any day up until August 14th, the town clerk is waiting for you with wide open arms. Please vote. Emily Kornheiser, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. And thank you at home for watching Meet the Candidates on Brattleboro Community Television. We we'll want to remind you to go to brattleboro.tv.org to see when this episode will air on channels 8 and 10, as well as to watch it on demand.